On a very rainy day at some point in the year 1980, I stood at the Porter Square subway station, which serves Cambridge and Somerville and the greater Boston area, and I was appealing to people to sign a petition. Like lots of others in college towns across the country, I was quite taken by a guy by the name of Congressman John Anderson of Illinois. And when his luck ran out in the primaries for his party's nomination, he became an independent. And so an army of young people like me fanned out all over the country to put his name on the ballot for President of the United States. Even though on that particular day signing the petition was really brisk, the constant rain was putting me in a pretty foul mood. That is until a woman cut across the street, you never wait for a walk sign in Boston, and got within earshot of me. So I just kind of tossed out my standard pitch. Would you like to sign a petition to put John Anderson on the ballot as an independent for President of the United States? And she said, certainly I will, as long as you don't tell my uncle. It was Carolyn Kennedy. And her uncle, Teddy, was running in the Democratic primaries against President Carter. Well, 33 years later, she would begin her tenure as the United States Ambassador to Japan. It's also pretty clear that she's gotten over me completely. And I cannot say the same about my starstruck memory of her. It was a moment that I think will go to my grave with me. Well, besides being a diplomat, Ambassador Kennedy is quite the author. 13 years ago, she, she put together this extraordinary volume called A Patriot's Handbook, songs of poems, stories, speeches, celebrating the land that we love. It's a must for every household. From President Reagan's farewell to the nation's speech to Woody Guthrie's This Land is Your Land, from John Winthrop's A Motto of Christian Charity that was given in 1630 to Justice's, uh, Justice Brennan's opinion concerning the New York Times Company versus Sullivan regarding course, freedom of the press, the book is just filled with what makes this country great. It's also filled with what makes it colorful, and also occasionally in error, and also what makes it willing to repent. It's just a fabulous volume, if you like that sort of thing. Well, in this particular book, there's one of the shorter offerings is a letter that's written to President Lincoln in August of 1864. A woman by the name of Ann Davis wrote of her personal predicament as a slave in a border state. As you may remember from your days in elementary school when President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, that decree only applied to those who were uh, to uh, freeing the slaves in the states in the found in the Confederacy. If you happen to live in a border state that was not in the rebellion as Ms. Davis was in living in Maryland, you were not freed at all. And so she wrote Mr. Lincoln the following letter. Mr. President, it is my desire to be free to go see my people on the eastern shore, my mistress won't let me. Will you please let me know if we are free and what I can do? I write to you for advice. Please send me word this week or as soon as possible and oblige. It is my desire to be free. You will please let me know if we are free. On this 4th of July weekend, I can think of only those two sentences striking me that particular way. And I hope it strikes the wider church as well into action. It is my desire to be free. In Ms. Davis's case, that referenced her being held, of course, as a slave. In our nation today, we no longer have slavery. But we still have those who are very desirous of being free. 
If you've seen a collection of Norman Rockwell's Life magazine covers, it's actually at a museum in Sturbridge, just down uh, the Mass Pike from Boston. You undoubtedly remember his paintings that commemorate uh, FDR's 1941 State of the Union address in which the President of the United States talked about the four freedoms. Freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. And while we believe we've a nation in which freedom of speech and freedom of worship are alive and well, there are many, way, way too many, who certainly desire to be free from want and fear. One out of five kids in our nation goes to bed hungry every single night. 14.5% of our fellow citizens live below the poverty rate. That's down a bit from a few years ago, and it's down significantly from when I would guess every one of us were born. But it's still tough. And, of course, from the nation's headlines to the news that we get from Yahoo on our cell phones, we know that much of the world, Bangladesh earlier this week when 20 were killed, Baghdad this morning, 91 killed in two bombings. We know of the fear that exists there. And we also know that there are parts of this country which can be pretty scary places. Ms. Davis also wrote in her petition, undoubtedly with hope and anticipation, the simple request. She said, let me know if we are free. And that, of course, is where the church comes into play. But I want to digress for just a minute. It's kind of interesting that supposedly the most repeated editorial in our history is from the New York Sun. And when I mention it, you all say, oh, yes, I remember that, 1897. You don't personally remember that, but of course you've read about it, in which the New York Sun answered Little Virginia's question to it regarding the existence of Santa Claus. Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus, the paper wrote. He exists as certainly as love and generosity and devotion exist, and you know that they abound and give to your life its highest beauty and joy. While those who are entrapped by want and fear are not writing about Santa Claus, they are asking something equally fantastic to their imagination, hampered by poverty. Can they, in fact, be free? And to that, this place and those like it are trying to answer with a resounding yes. Free from want is tough to address, to be sure, but not all that removed from the sentiments of the New York Sun because of our giving out of the abundance of the blessings that God has provided us and provided this nation. This place alleviates suffering by, in Christ's name, because of you, paying utility bills and providing for rent and medicine and gas and temporary housing and food and clothing to those who come to our doors. It is very, very, very rare that we can't help or don't help. Now, our efforts are, of course, not meeting the totality of the needs of the entire world. Not unlike the fellow throwing sand dollar sea urchins back into the ocean, while it seems futile given the amount of the little guys stranded on the beaches of the world, it makes a difference to that particular sand dollar who is tossed back into the sea and thus a place in life. We model the possibility that poverty can be met with the generosity of spirit. That is how we become perfect in every way, like God. But perhaps the most remarkable thing we can do is to also answer those who want to know if they have any reason to believe that they too can be free from fear. And to that we can respond with not only, well, how does the assurance of the forgiveness of sins and release from the sting of death strike you? We also answer even more profoundly than did the New York Sun to that little eight-year-old Virginia. Not only does God love us through Christ unconditionally and without limit, 
But when it's all over and done with, it actually isn't all over and done with at all. Because we are also promised everlasting life. And just as important as that is, when the moment of fear shows its ugly head, we also can do something that just reduces it entirely to dust. We can embrace those who find themselves alone and isolated and bring them into an awareness of the body of Christ, which is filled with brothers and sisters that they may not know they had. Forty of them here at this service, forty at the last. On this 4th of July weekend, if you have been as discouraged as I have been by the headlines of the newspaper over these last weeks, just toss the paper aside for just a minute. Just a minute. We can do today what Lincoln could not do 153 years ago with the existence of slavery. As a matter of fact, sadly, there's no evidence at all that President Lincoln ever responded to that letter. But we can tell the Annie Davises of the world that they actually are free. They're free because they are the beloved of God's. Now, all we need to do is just to get the world to help make that proclamation apparent. And that's going to take some work. A lot of work. But we are the body of Christ. And in us, God can do infinitely more than we can ever ask or imagine. As Ambassador Kennedy wrote in her introduction to her book, our nation celebrates the individual, and just as it provides for us, so it expects of us. America has given her best. Now it's our turn. Well, as the followers of Jesus, that can only be seen as an enticing and a delightful invitation to more vibrant ministry. What could be better than that? Amen.